Welcome to episode three of a Horror Buddies podcast. Once again, brought to you by HorrorBuddies.com. I'm the owner and creator of Horror Buddies and your host, Brandon Beatty. Uh, don't forget to check out our store, support the podcast, and just go there and buy everything you can. So today I wanted to mention a great source from some horror short films on YouTube, Omleto. Um, I haven't watched a ton of them, but I've been impressed with the ones I've seen so far. If you aren't familiar with them, they produce short film content. I think most of them are less than 30 minutes and many in the 15 to 20 minute range. So they're great for little quick bites of horror or other genres. Um, they have probably about 45 of them in the horror genre. If you get a chance, check them out. Just search YouTube for Omleto, O-M-E-L-E-T-O. Let me know what you think. Um, like I say, I've only watched a handful, but I'd love to know what you guys think about them. So I just watched a trailer for a movie called I Saw the Glow from A24. Kind of a Channel Zero, Candle Cove kind of feel to it, so probably nothing really unique. But it seems by the trailer that it takes a lot further than that. I'll be honest if I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't recognize any of the cast. I looked a couple of them up. Um, the one I noticed was Justice Smith from Jurassic World Fall on Kingdom. I liked his character in, that, character in that one, so I'd definitely be interested in checking it out. Um, also, there's a new one called Something in the Water. Again, the trailer looks like a very typical run-of-the-mill shark movie. Are they are Jaws movies even horror? I guess they're kind of scary <laughs> for some people. Um, but uh, no big surprises probably there. That's one thing I've noticed about horror films, though. Not even just the horror ones, but the movies in general. Seems like they can't figure out how to actually end the films. It's like many of them start out making this film without a finished script, and then when they get to the end, instead of finishing it, they just stop. Um, I know the filmmakers love to leave it open for sequels, and that's that's fine. I mean, if it's a good film, we want a sequel. But add some kind of closure at the end. Don't leave us guessing for the whole thing. Um, some of them just leave way too many unanswered questions. I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's just me. Let me know how you guys feel. So continuing on the real life horrors, let's do another one that uh, serial killer killer that has not been identified. Now, while researching this, they say there's between 50 and 100 active serial killers in the United States alone at any one time. But looking up the definition of a serial killer, according to the FBI, it's a series of two or more murders committed as separate events, usually but not always by one offending offender acting alone. Now, any of that fascinated by that topic, or there's plenty of pairs and couples that should kill together. I really think their definition adds the possibility for a lot more potential serial killers that may be out there. I think maybe they need to define serial killer a little better, and then maybe there wouldn't be so many of them. Um, so anyways, in the real life one, let's discuss the bouncing ball killer. I picked this one for several reasons. One is just the name. It's hilarious. I love that it's not a super menacing title like a ripper, or strangler. You know, just I think that a lot of these take away from any of the power the killers may have as the publicity feeds their egos. So the bouncing ball killer is to believe to be responsible for raping and murdering at least six women from 1959 and 1960 in Los Angeles. All the victims were also elderly. The first one, Ruth Gwynn, was on her way home when she was attacked. She was uh, actually able to tell the police what happened before succumbing to her injuries hours later. Um, in 1960, from January to June, the next thing victims would be attacked and killed. But it's the final one, Mercedes Langerden. Langerden? Something like that. Uh, on June 26, 1960, 72-year-old was found by her roommate, told the police she saw a large black man leaving and bouncing a ball as he left. She also stated he was well-dressed, wearing Ivy League clothes. There were also several other suspects in the crimes um, that may have been the same person and haven't officially been attributed to the killer. After a sketch was released to the media dubbed the nickname Bouncing Ball Killer. Uh, Bouncing Ball Strangler, Bouncing Ball Slayer, a couple of them out there. Hundreds of tips would come in with no arrests. In July, a man named Mobile Harper, Noble Harper, 
was arrested mainly because he was seen bouncing a ball outside a shopping market. Makes sense. Must be him. <laughs> he was released the following day. There was nothing else to point to him. Several other people were thought to be the killer, but one, a Raymond Ward Clemens, actually confessed to the killings. After taking a polygraph test, he failed as it showed he was not being truthful. He was, however, convicted of the murder of a 19-year-old college student, Nina Thurin, in July 1960. So in the end, there's plenty of suspects, but none that can be directly linked. Uh, will it ever, ever be solved? Only time will tell. The technology of solving crimes, uh, they're solving crimes all the times they never thought would be solved. So I guess there is always hope. Well, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the Horror Buddies podcast. I'd love your feedback. Let me know what you'd like to hear. Um, if there's more movies, TV show reviews, real life content, whatever it is, let me know. Um, I'll see you next time.